Hello and welcome to Inside the Americas on France 24. Coming up on the show this week. All three armed forces chiefs in Brazil resign after the defense minister was replaced by the president in the latest cabinet shakeup. Central American families turned away from the United States find themselves in a precarious situation in Mexico. We'll be bringing you a special report from Juarez. And prosecution witnesses, including the girl who filmed the video showing George Floyd's last minutes, testify against former Minneapolis police officer Derek Chavon. But first, all three leaders of Brazil's armed forces have resigned. The move comes after the country's defense minister was replaced by the president. Jair Bolsonaro recently reshuffled his cabinet as his popularity sinks to new lows over how he's handled the coronavirus pandemic so far. Sharon Gaffney reports. In an unprecedented move, Brazil's three military chiefs have quit their posts, plunging President Jair Bolsonaro into a fresh political crisis. The announcement followed a meeting with the country's new defence minister. Analysts say the resignations are in protest against what they say are the president's efforts to assert greater control over the military. In his first comments as minister, Walter Souza Braga Neto praised the military dictatorship that killed and tortured thousands of Brazilians over a 20-year period. In a statement, he said the dictatorship that began on March 31, 1964, was part of Brazil's historic trajectory and must be understood and celebrated. The comments mirror Bolsonaro's own views. A former army captain, since taking office in 2019, he's relied heavily on ex-soldiers to staff senior government posts. On Monday, he was forced to give his embattled administration a thorough shake-up, replacing six ministers, as well as his chief of staff, attorney general and government secretary. Bolsonaro has faced heavy criticism and calls for his impeachment over his mishandling of the COVID pandemic, which has killed more than 300,000 Brazilians. One in ten migrants trying to make their way into the United States illegally is a minor. Many make the journey across Central America alone, by foot, in search of at least one parent. The journey is long, dangerous and comes with no guarantees. Central American families that are turned away from the United States find themselves in a precarious situation in Mexico. They're forced to survive with many children and no income. France 24 correspondents on the ground in Juarez filed this report. Those mountains on the horizon are the United States, a still distant goal for these children of migrants. 300 people live in this shelter on the outskirts of Ciudad Juarez. More than half of them are minors and don't go to school. For months or even years, they are stuck with their families in this precarious situation. Some of them don't even find their way to the shelters. For a year and a half, Rogelio's family has been surviving in Mexico as best they can. With his wife and five children, one of whom is disabled, they fled the violence in Honduras. Rogelio escaped death after being attacked, but he remains severely injured and cannot work. We need help to get to the other side. We suffer a lot here. It's dangerous, and we can't stay on the street because we're chased or attacked by criminals. We just want to get out of this situation. All seven of them manage one day at a time. They were given a chance to stay in this small basic room for a night, and now they must leave. On the way to the United States, some miners are alone. This center welcomes teenagers 12 to 17 years old all of them trying to rejoin a member of their family in the United States. This is the case of Flaco. He left Guatemala and crossed the border illegally before being deported. I couldn't stay because the gang members wanted me to plant marijuana and I didn't want to waste my life like that. That's why I came and also because I want to help my grandparents and I want to meet my mother, who's in the United States. She left me when I was a year old. I've never met her. I've only seen pictures. I've never hugged her, ever. As soon as he arrived at the White House, Joe Biden promised to ease the reunification of minor migrants with their families. In some cases, the procedure is possible, but it is long and uncertain. It depends today more than ever on the policy of the United States. There has not been much change, even if there are a lot of promises. Rogelio and his family have finally found a place in a shelter a small respite in this space shared with other migrants. 
they hope to be able to pass to the other side and offer a better future to their children. That's why children in Honduras don't know how to read because they're not taught. They just play and learn nothing. I want to work and pay my taxes, like all the others. I want to start achieving something. Migration makes the youngest vulnerable. Approximately 14,000 minors are held in U.S. migration centers. Prosecution witnesses testified against former Minneapolis police officer Derek Chauvin. He is charged in the murder of George Floyd. On Tuesday, jurors heard from a teenager who recorded the video showing a Chauvin kneeling on Floyd's neck for nearly nine minutes, which was viewed by millions of people around the world. She captured George Floyd's final moments in a video that went on to shock the world. Daniela Frazier was just 17 at the time of Floyd's arrest, so her testimony in court was audio only. The teenager told jurors how witnessing George Floyd's death changed her life. She broke down several times. It's been nights. I stayed up apologizing and, and apologizing to George Floyd for not doing more and not physically interacting and not saving his life. The pain of not having done more at the time weighs on Genevieve Hansen as well. The firefighter recalled how she was stopped from giving medical assistance during the arrest. Today, the 25-year-old still holds vivid memories of Floyd's final moments. He wasn't moving and he was cuffed and that's a, a three grown men is a lot of putting all their weight on somebody is too much. Witnesses told jurors how they begged former Minneapolis police officer Derek Chauvin to take his knee off George Floyd's neck, but their pleas were ignored. On day two of the trial, emotions were high. Chauvin's defense attorney had several tense moments with witness and MMA fighter Donald Williams. The court heard how Williams taunted Chauvin during the arrest. The defense say he was one of several onlookers who distracted police officers. Chauvin is facing charges of second-degree murder, third-degree murder and manslaughter with a potential 40-year prison sentence. The Senate in the U.S. state of Arkansas has approved banning gender-conforming treatments for minors. If enacted, the bill would prohibit doctors from providing gender-conforming drugs or surgery to minors. Lawmakers in over 20 states have moved to ban transgender women and girls from female sports this year, with Republican governors in three states, including Arkansas, Tennessee and Mississippi, signing them into law. For more on this story, we can bring in France 24's Olivia salazar Winspear. Good to see you, Olivia. Talk us through the latest developments in Arkansas. Well, the bill you mentioned, Delano, is now in the hands of Governor Asa Hutchinson. And if he signs it, Arkansas will be the first state to ban gender-affirming medical procedures for trans youths in what has been described by the American Civil Liberties Union as the most extreme anti-trans law in the US to date. And it does look likely Hutchinson has previously supported anti-trans legislation. Just earlier this month, he greenlit a law allowing doctors to refuse treatment to somebody because of religious or moral objections which many people interpret as a move to limit health care for LGBTQ plus patients. He also approved a law that bans transgender women and girls from competing in school sports consistent with their gender identity. Now, that's a big topic. As you mentioned, Tennessee and Mississippi have also implemented anti-trans laws when it comes to high school sports. And West Virginia is also on track to follow them. Now, the argument from those who want to back those kind of bills, mainly Republicans, is that they're protecting women's sports, that athletes who are trans girls but who were born male are naturally stronger, faster and bigger. Mm. Well, the first successful uh, sports ban legislation was signed into law in Idaho last year, but a federal judge issued an injunction against that ban, saying it's likely to be deemed unconstitutional. Now, anti-trans legislation has been a hot-button issue in, in some of those red states, with public bathrooms up for debate as well. And that's right. Now, if you cast your mind back to 2016, North Carolina implemented a bathroom ban. That means that trans people there cannot use public toilets that match their gender. 
And the law came directly after same-sex marriage was legalised in the US in 2015, and it has been widely interpreted as a backlash or part of this culture war between a progressive camp and a more conservative camp in the country. And it does really come back to politics and votes, because some have suggested that GOP lawmakers have seized upon this issue of trans teens in sports because it galvanises voters. Recent polls have shown that Republican voters were actually more interested in that question than who's entering public bathrooms. And the truth is that this so-called hot-button issue really affects a tiny, tiny minority of people. There are estimates that transgender minors make up anywhere between 0.7 and 2% of the US population, which means it affects very few of those voters on a day-to-day -day level. And this comes just months into the Biden administration, where the, the climate is more progressive, if you will. So how does that explain the timing of all of this? Well, yeah, you would think it's more progressive. I mean, trans awareness and visibility have been steadily growing in the United States. And in line with that, more young people are perhaps coming out uh, than they would have done before. And that's given rise to some concrete changes. Uh, a number of high school athletic societies have allowed students to compete in sports based on their gender identity. And of course, a really important first for trans people in America was the recent nomination of Rachel Levine, a trans woman, as assistant and health secretary in President Biden's administration. Now, she's likely to be a critic of this latest legislation, adding her voice to uh, critics like the ACLU, as I mentioned, and the American Academy of Pediatricians, uh, who are against uh, these bills. Democrat lawmakers have said the laws clearly discriminate against uh, a group of people who are already vulnerable. And it's true that on a federal level, uh, there's it's prohibited to discriminate against any person on the basis of race, sex, gender or national origin. And there have also been critics from the world of sports, for example. They say that these laws address a problem that simply does not exist, pointing out that it's very difficult to find the data on how many children are participating in sports when it comes to trans mm. teenagers. And there is actually no data to suggest that trans girls would have the competitive edge over cisgender girls when it comes to high school sports. Olivia, thank you very much for that. Olivia salazar Winspear there. Finally, we're going to leave you with pictures from Washington, D.C., where the famous cherry blossom trees are in full bloom. The National Park Service warning that access would be shut down if crowds became unmanageable. The warning seemed to have worked since crowds have been much smaller than in previous years. That's it for me, from all of us on the team. Thank you very much for watching.